This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gido Yort. It's Thursday, May 21st. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. We begin our broadcast with more depressing news on the global coronavirus pandemic. The World Health Organization says a record 106,000 new cases of COVID-19 were confirmed in the last 24 hours, the highest number over a 24-hour period since the outbreak erupted. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says nearly two-thirds of the new cases were confirmed in just four countries. He did not name them but multiple news reports say the nations are the United States, Russia, Brazil, and India. Expressing concern for poor countries, Tedros says, quote, there's still a long way to go in the pandemic. We're very concerned about rising cases in low and middle income nations. The number of worldwide infections now tops 5 million people, and the death toll has climbed past 328,000, but more than 1.8 million have recovered from COVID-19. The United States has the most confirmed cases with 1.5 million and the highest death toll, topping 93,000. Now to Africa, where Botswana has ended its 48-day coronavirus lockdown, allowing all businesses and schools to reopen under strict conditions. The diamond-rich southern African country has been slowly easing restrictions over the past two weeks, with only selected economic sectors such as mines being allowed to operate. In North Africa, Egypt says that it's expanding its COVID-19 testing, announcing that all of the country's 320 general hospitals will offer testing to people showing symptoms of coronavirus. Government officials say people with minor symptoms will be asked to go home as they wait on test results, while those showing serious symptoms will be kept in the hospital. Coronavirus is bringing to the forefront the importance of the role governments play in addressing a global pandemic. Africa has long struggled with governance issues, but now citizens must rely on their elected leaders to protect them from the virus. VOA Salem Solomon examines how several governments are handling this public health crisis, featuring an interview with Uganda's long-serving president, Yoweri Museveni, in a collaboration with NBS TV, a VOA affiliate in Kampala. As the world scrambled to battle a pandemic that is costing millions of lives and has already infected over 80,000 people in Africa, South African President Sarah Ramaphosa quickly stepped up the country's fight against the coronavirus. We are calling on all South Africans to wear a face mask whenever you leave home. Our clothing and textile industry including small businesses, are gearing up to produce these masks on a mass scale. That wasn't the only bold measure Ramaphosa took. He called the military into action, ordering the deployment of 73,000 troops to enforce a lockdown. The country has also been aggressive in testing, accounting for about one-third of all coronavirus tests in Africa. It has the highest number of cases with more than 12,000 South Africans infected. The lockdown prompted protests and some deadly clashes with security forces. But after two weeks into the fight with the virus, Ramaphosa began to ease restrictions on May 13. On the other hand, Tanzanian President John Magufuli has focused his attention on different targets, public health officials and the international community. Magufuli, who used to teach chemistry, has been skeptical of the virus and has echoed conspiracy theories. On live television, he told the nation that the country's national laboratory had inflated coronavirus numbers. He even sent samples of fruit to be tested for the virus as a way to expose false positives. When we took a purple sample for a COVID-19 test, we labeled the sample as Elizabeth Ann, age 26, female. 
the result came out positive. This means those fluids inside the popo are coronavirus positive, something which is totally insane. The country has been criticized for its secrecy in reporting cases. Even the cause of death of the country's justice minister has been cloaked in mystery. While in Uganda, President Yoweri Museveni said scientists had learned from past public health crises like AIDS and Ebola. The key, he said, is to determine the most common means of transmission and block it. On May 7, Uganda mandated that people wear masks in public. You have a mask because it is riding on the droplets, the breath of the infected person. Uh, if you block it, then you block it. That's why I would like you to put on the masks all the time. When asked about the health of the economy, the president assured Ugandans that his administration's priority is to save lives. There's no way you can compare that so many people should die so that we make money. No, <laughs> the money can wait. We shall money is there even tomorrow. So really, there's no comparison. You don't compare the uncomparables. There's no comparison. With life, we go for life first, and then economy later will come later. Nigerian President Mohamed Buhari has probably been touched more personally by coronavirus than any head of state. On April 17, his chief of staff died from the disease. Like other leaders, he enforced a lockdown but began easing it on May 4 in key areas including the capital Abuja and the largest city Lagos. Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, has the fifth highest number of coronavirus cases with just over 5,000. Buhari believes it is time to reopen key parts of the economy. The federal government shall deploy all the necessary human material and technical resources to support the state in controlling and containing the pandemic. These differing impacts in several countries highlight the health care needs and the importance of good leadership and strong government institutions when it comes to battling the pandemic. Salam Solomon, VOA News, Washington. This search for solutions to contain the new coronavirus continues and Africa is part of the race. In part two of Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu's conversation with Dr. Ahmed Ogwell Oma, Deputy Director of the Africa CDC, she asked him about his reaction on Madagascar's COVID organics and herbal drink claimed by the country's president, Andrew Rajolina, to be a treatment for the coronavirus. What about solutions on the continent? What is happening in Madagascar with COVID organics? The Africa CDC has not really supported this uh, initiative. What is uh, the position of the centers with regards to local solution and particularly uh, traditional medicine, given that it's part of uh, Africa's uh, culture, Africa's uh, tradition? Um, as Africa CDC, we encourage innovation. Indeed, we know that um, there is capacity for innovation in Africa, and we are encouraging governments uh, to provide uh, the required environment for innovators uh, to come up with possible uh, solutions. So in the case of Madagascar, we are in touch with the government there, and uh, we are going to look at their data, um, and also uh, we are going to uh, facilitate multi-center trials uh, so that their results can be reproducible. Whatever we come up with, we are going to make public. Uh, at the moment, we are still studying uh, that information, and uh, there is no uh, decision that has been made by Africa CDC yet. Let's talk about vaccines. Some people feel like uh, Africans are being taken as guinea pigs, especially in this case where there was a controversy with some French researchers. Uh, clinical trials we know are essential in vaccine and treatment development. So how do you regain the trust of communities who are skeptical while ensuring that uh, they are protected in this process? Um, I think it is important first to uh, condemn in the strongest possible terms um, those uh, who were recorded and documented uh, to be speaking negatively about Africans in as far as uh, uh, clinical trials uh, are concerned. Um, they do not meet uh, the, the threshold of um, uh, scientists because scientists do not speak like that. 
Um, secondly, is that all clinical trials that are being done in Africa and we are supporting are meeting the gold standard of uh, uh, doing a clinical trial. They are not only being done in Africa. Each and every one of the clinical trials that are being done in Africa are multi-center based and the same is being done elsewhere in the world. Uh, those uh, candidate vaccines are safe. Uh, those candidate vaccines are uh, uh, being looked for efficiency and efficacy. We are not allowing uh, onto the continent uh, any clinical trials that do not meet the global standards of uh, safety and uh, efficacy. Lockdown measures have been implemented around the world, including in Africa. But we've seen in some countries that uh, these measures have had a very, very uh, terrible economic impact. Um, in the course of next week, we will release um, a, a guideline on uh, easing the lockdowns. Uh, and this is necessary because, uh, one, Africa's economy is largely a daily bread sort of economy, where people must go out, they must work, and then they earn for the day. But there's no uh, reserve. Uh, for most people in Africa. It is important that this is done in a manner that is uh, good for the country because you may end up chasing the economy and uh, COVID-19 uh, devastates uh, your workforce. So it has to be done in a, an incremental manner. Having said that, uh, I must add that uh, the effect of lockdowns is going to be seen in the next few weeks. Uh, because the numbers are telling a story that it has not been rising fast. The numbers are telling a story um, that uh, transmission has been slowed down. And this is important for Africa because our health systems are fragile and we cannot afford to have many people exposed and many people critically ill. Uh, there is a concern that uh, reallocation or allocation of resources to fight COVID-19 will put at risk the prevention and treatment of other diseases like Malaria and measles is the Africa CDC ensuring that other diseases are still gaining uh, the attention that they deserve. Um, from the very beginning of this um, uh, outbreak in Africa, we have uh, provided guidance to governments um, so that the normal health services do not stop. And uh, key uh, amongst those is that uh, governments designate special areas, special facilities, for uh, managing COVID-19 cases, and the rest of the health system can be able to continue to do its work around uh, the other ailments and the other conditions uh, that uh, the population uh, is suffering from. We cannot afford to disrupt the normal health systems because uh, uh, it is uh, a danger uh, to society. If we disrupt it, then people will end up suffering and dying from other conditions that uh, not just uh, COVID-19. So our advice to governments is do not stop uh, the other health uh, the services, continue with those, designate special facilities to look after COVID-19 patients, and uh, in the planning, uh, other health uh, services must still be at the core of the provision of uh, health services. That was Africa 54's health correspondent, Lino Mudu, speaking with Dr. Ahmed Owell Ouma, Deputy Director of the Africa CDC. Mwekesi Majoro is the new Lesotho Prime Minister. He was sworn in Wednesday, just one day after his predecessor resigned under pressure over a scandal involving the killing of his wife. He will remain in charge until scheduled elections in June 2022. It is only the third time that power has changed hands peacefully since Lesotho gained its independence from Britain in 1966. Thomas Tabane, 80, bowed to calls to resign Tuesday, three months after police named him and his current wife, Messiah, as suspects in the murder of his former spouse, Lipolelo, in a case that plunged the mountain kingdom into a political crisis. Majoro is promising to make tackling COVID-19, poverty, and unemployment his top priorities. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, 
a coronavirus border closure, a boon for a South African tech company, Malaicha. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Africa 54. Uganda's security officers stand accused of using excessive force and targeting political opponents while carrying out lockdown measures during the coronavirus pandemic. On April 19, police stormed the home of Ugandan legislator Francis Zaake and arrested him for allegedly disobeying presidential directives against distributing food aid. He was released a week later, but with scars all over his body and left him partially blind. Halima Thumani reports from Kampala. Ugandan legislator Francis Zake gets goose pimples as he recalls his alleged torture at the hands of police. Police officers raided his house on April 19 and arrested him for flouting the president's order against politicians giving food aid during the COVID-19 lockdown. Zake says police hung him by chains inside a police truck and physically abused him. I lost my sight completely. I could not see anything because they used two cans to spray my eyes. Critics say Uganda's state security are using excessive force and in some cases targeting the government's political opponents while enforcing the coronavirus lockdown. What is happening is anybody who seeks accountability whether it being in the media, the civil society, is quickly silenced, is quickly arrested or intimidated. And so actions that lead to accountability uh, being pushed to this side as state agencies become more and more repressive and use acts of torture. Uganda's Minister for Internal Affairs, Obiga Kanya, claims without evidence that Zake's injuries were likely self-inflicted. Uganda police spokesman Fred Enanga says the allegations of torture are being investigated. A team of medical experts before he was uh, uh, released on police bond from the Ministry of Health were able to examine him and uh, we are also interested in the medical report that will come out from there. If the finding supports acts of torture, the officers who are found culpable will definitely get suspended and will get charged to court. Meanwhile, Zake is suing the police officers involved as well as Uganda's Attorney General for infringing his human right to dignity and freedom from torture. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala. Thousands of Nigerians are receiving free mental health care through a program to help people cope with stress in isolation from COVID-19. The program called Mentally Aware Nigeria, or MANI, was formed by psychologists and medical experts to create an environment where people can seek mental health care without fear of stigma or discrimination. Timothy Obiezu has more from Abuja. Nigerian psychologist Aisha Abdullahi holds daily psychotherapy sessions at her home in Abuja. She is one of many psychologists and counselors responding to a significant increase in mental health problems due in part to the spread of coronavirus. Immediately the lockdown started, especially in um, some states in Nigeria, there was a complete increase in the presence of people on social media. And almost every conversation, in, in a few conversations that you look through, you see somebody talking about a mental health issue. It's either they're experiencing fear, panic, um, their stress level has increased because of working from home, or they're having anxiety, or they are isolated alone, so there is feelings of loneliness and depression. Before the pandemic ever started, the World Health Organization estimated one in four Nigerians suffered from mental health issues. Abdullahi says it's the uncertainty that's driving much of the anxiety in patients she treats. At the moment, we still don't have 
much um, information about whether there's going to be a vaccine, when it's going to be, whether there's medication. So it's a scary situation. And obviously, even for somebody who has been taking care of their mental health, um, there is a lot of grief also for people who have lost loved ones, for people who have lost their means of livelihood. The stigma attached to seeking out mental health treatment is one of the major reasons that only about 10% of Nigerians get the help they need, according to medical professionals. I remember having a panic attack once and um, I told my sister and she laughed at me because, I mean, why should you have a panic attack? You should be a strong black um, woman, Nigerian woman, you should toughen up. Mentally aware Nigeria is trying to help people like Tara. It has introduced Project COVID, online sessions that engage viewers across the country to help them cope. Money has really touched my life in ways that I cannot even begin to even speak about. I mean, just doing this video alone, talking about my struggles with mental health, talking about um, things I had to go through, those enough a lot to even show me how well I have become. No one knows when researchers will find a vaccine for the coronavirus. Until then, Nigerian psychologists such as Abdullahi and groups like Mani will have their hands full. Timothy Obiezu, for VOA News, Abuja. The coronavirus pandemic has left very few spheres of life unaffected. And while the virus is dangerous and has already caused hundreds of thousands of deaths, it has a positive effect on the environment. People leave their homes less, so there's less litter and less carbon emission. But it's still to be seen whether the newly acquired green habits are here to stay. Maxim Moskalkov has our story. Researcher Jordan Wildish, author of the Environmental Tracking Project, has created an online chart that shows nitrogen dioxide emissions in large cities before and after the WHO pandemic declaration. The results, in most U.S. cities, the carbon emission rate fell by anything from 15% in San Francisco to 30% in Los Angeles. On the U.S. average, uh, it's about a 30% drop in nitrogen dioxide pollution. And so we see those drops as really showing a, a change in behavior by collecting and understanding the impacts of our behavior changes on air quality we can hopefully inform policy going forward that will allow us to rebuild a sustainable economy. The number of lives saved thanks to the drop in emissions might surpass the number of COVID-19 victims, believes Marshall Burke from the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. The improvements in air quality were quite large. We saw roughly 20 to 30 percent improvements in air quality in a very short period uh, over China. Uh, so my calculation was conservatively it could have saved uh, an additional 50,000 lives uh, across China. However, the slowdown in industrial production levels and lower energy use is just one side of it. Since more people are staying at home, their carbon footprint is diminishing, believes Maya Almaraz an environment specialist from the University of California. I could definitely see more people continuing to work from home once we have these um, sort of working practices in place, which could mean an increase in reduced emissions going forward. Energy efficiency expert Timur Ahmedov says the pandemic has proven how easily millions of people can change their behavior while acquiring new habits like working remotely and use public transport less. What we've seen is that if people change their behavior at the same time, the air quality is going to improve significantly. The argument that our actions can hardly affect the environment and that we need at least 50 years to see some change is being proven wrong. Pandemics have changed the way people view their worlds, says anthropologist Yelena Konis. Campaigns to prevent the spread of tuber tuberculosis in the early 20th century, for instance, began to discourage spitting in the U.S. And that became something that became culturally ingrained over time. Um, if you take a more recent epidemic, HIV AIDS, we began changing our behavior in response to that disease quite dramatically. And we began, uh, for a certain generation, they began using condoms more regularly what people are seeing now are the speedy results of a forced experiment to cut the carbon emissions across the globe. 
The question is, will these changes stick once the world opens back up? Maxim Moskalkov for VOA News, Washington. Malaysia, an app that lets people in South Africa buy groceries for others in crisis hit Zimbabwe, saw the use of its services surge after borders closed under a nationwide COVID-19 lockdown. Zimbabweans living and working in South Africa have been paying bus drivers to ferry food to their relatives back home for decades. Now customers make their order via the app and the company delivers the goods in Zimbabwe where it stores the items in warehouses. Before the lockdown, Malaicha handled an average of 20,000 to 30,000 orders a month, but that number spiked by nearly 200% in April. The coronavirus pandemic has gutted New York City's restaurants. Celebrity chef and restaurateur Tom Colicchio discusses what's at stake and what can be done to save the industry. Here's VOS Tina Trin. In New York City, restaurants stay closed except for takeout and delivery service. It's a fraction of the business they normally do, but even when operations fully resume, recovery will be difficult. When we open up, we are going to have to open up into social distancing in our business, meaning we have to remove half our seats. Celebrity chef Tom Calicchio co-founded the Independent Restaurant Coalition to lobby Congress for long-term funding. We're asking the government for a restaurant stabilization package that will not only get us open, but keep us going for the next, you know, eight to 12 months, because that's what we're going to need. Calicchio says the bigger question is not when restaurants reopen, it's a question of when the public feels comfortable walking to an establishment when the bartenders and the wait staff are wearing masks and when the whole place smells like, you know, um, Lysol. One New York City Council proposal calls for expanding street closures to allow for more alfresco dining. It's already happening, albeit unofficially. The warm weather recently proved too hard to resist as many broke social distancing orders on the Upper East Side and congregated outdoors, some giving new meaning to the phrase sidewalk seating. But in a city of 27,000 restaurants, outdoor space isn't always a given. In the meantime, hunger and unemployment persist. Calicchio thinks he has a solution. If you want to keep that supply chain intact and you want to keep workers working and you want to get rid of those lines that we're seeing for people lining up for food banks, fund restaurants to become community feeding centers. Calicchio says distributing work across the city's restaurants keeps more of them in business while helping the efforts of local food pantries. But before anything can happen, ensuring the health and safety of workers and customers is critical. My biggest fear is, yeah, we'll open up some restaurants, you know, we'll get it going, and two months later, we run out of money, everyone's back on employment, and the restaurants are permanently closed. A recovery with more questions than answers. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching.